You know me, I love a good 3D platformer. Though I wonder how anyone would come to that conclusion because 75% of my channel in the past year or so has been racing games, but 3D platformers are like my comfort food genre. Actually, with how many hours I likely have in the entire Forza series, I think racing games would be my comfort food genre. Look, I don't care, I like 3D platformers a lot, okay? From my first foray into the genre with games like Spyro the Dragon to even as recently as a month ago with the newest in the Ratchet and Clank series, I've always adored 3D platformers as very comfy, laid-back experiences. There are very few things more relaxing to me than jumping across gaps and picking up collectibles. I find this genre very cosy, even if it's never advertised as such. Truthfully, I always wanted a sort of comfy, cosy platformer where the focus isn't necessarily on challenge, but just exploring a world, finding stuff, and having fun. Specifically, something like Breath of the Wild. Running around and finding secret areas and collectibles in a massive open world, but with controls more adjacent to something like Jack and Daxter. Uh, that's a bit of a pipe dream though, so I would happily settle on a more standard 3D platformer structure for this type of laid back experience. Frog Vibes apparently heard that internalized thought of mine with their telekinesis or whatever freaky deaky powers they have because they looked me dead in the eye and said, Hey, Remy, here comes Nico. What? Who the heck is Nico? <laughs> Marketed as a game for tired people, Here Comes Nico is a 3D platformer slash collectathon that just released on Steam on August 3rd and is coming to Nintendo Switch in the very near future. Yeah, the cute art style and the fact that it's a 3D platformer to begin with caught my eye, but a game for tired people? Whoa, that's me! I'm tired people! I'm gonna love the heck out of this game, right? <sighs> Kinda? I'll say it straight off the bat, there are going to be a lot of people who will love this game. They will vibe with what Here Comes Nico has to offer so hard, and honestly, if you like the look of anything you see in the trailer, I think you'll enjoy it. But there are a few things that really hold it back for me in particular, especially when comparing it to indie greats such as A Hat in Time. Coincidentally, Gears for Breakfast, the guys who developed A Hat in Time, are actually the lads who published this, which has led to a misconception that this is Gears for Breakfast's next game when it's being developed by a totally different team. And I think people coming in expecting A Hat in Time 2 are going to be very disappointed, because in all honesty, despite sharing a genre, they feel like two very different sides of the same coin, to a point where sometimes it feels like a bit of a stretch calling Here Comes Nico a traditional 3D platformer. But we'll get into that in a moment. First off, what's Here Comes Nico all about? Well, after you kind of unceremoniously get thrown into the pause menu at the start of the game instead of a proper title screen for some reason, you're introduced to Tadpole Incorporated through a charming little cutscene. Tadpole Inc. are a company who hire people to be professional friends for people who need a companion, and you play as Nico, who's just applied to become one of those professional friends. Nico has just moved out of what appears to be a hostile family situation and applies for the job to be able to pay for their apartment. And an executive manager at the company, Pepper, puts them through a trial by accompanying them across several different islands and letting Nico prove just how swish of a friend they can really be. I really love this idea. I think it might rub some people the wrong way, but I love the whole friend without the D aesthetic they're going for because, to me at least, it oozes comfy vibes. And that's a word you might hear me say a fair bit in this video, comfy. As someone who slings that word around like it's going out of style, this game is peak comfy. From the laid back setting of tiny little islands to the absolutely adorable 2D sprites used for every character to the chill and actually really gosh dang good music, everything here is deliberately presented to lure you into a sense of ease, like you should just be taking a load off and soaking it all in without a single care in the world. It could also just be that the characters look like they were designed by fairies, so I'm just in my element and surrounded by my people though, but oh, these character designs are so good! Hi Gunter, I want to give you a little smooch. Hello little Lima friend, you're just perfect. Why are all the birds so good looking? And wow, Trixie, you're adorable as heck. Hello, can you be my fursona instead? I think this art style might turn a few players off. The 2D sprites on 3D backgrounds thing could be a little jarring, but I think these designs are just perfect. And though these characters don't say an awful lot, their designs are going to stick with me for a good while. Especially Nico themselves. Like, for one, not gonna lie, feeling a bit of gender envy looking at them, and I also relate specifically to how they sit. But also, heck yeah, non-binary rep. That's the cool thing about indie games. Devs can just say, hey, our player character's non-binary. Or, hey, our turtles are gay. And no one's there to stop them. They can just do it. And it's really neat. To say Nico is a cool character purely because they're non-binary would be shallow, of course. But honestly, even though they're a mostly silent protagonist, I still really like them. Nico is somehow full of charm despite barely saying anything, and I love them to bits. Even the gameplay is laid back, and this is where I harken back to where I said you shouldn't be comparing Here Comes Nico to A Hat in Time. 
Nico has a very limited set of moves, a jump and a dive is all they get access to control-wise. They're able to wall jump, dive in mid-air, climb ladders and swim, and there's not really much else they can do apart from a late game ability, as well as pressing the dive button repeatedly to bounce along the ground or across water on their belly, which, you know, movement in any other game now has to live up to this, but yeah, Nico isn't capable of a lot, but they don't need to be. Instead of numerous challenges revolving around Nico's moveset, the variety of tasks Nico's asked to do takes those simple controls and uses them in various ways to interact with the environment and the characters in them. So while jumping and diving is all they can do, you'll certainly be doing a lot more than that. In the first level for example, one of the earliest things you'll do is punt a volleyball a couple of times, which you'll do simply by touching it. Minutes later you'll come across a little girl trying to plant flowers and you have to fill up all the pots at once by planting the flowers in a specific way, which you do so simply by jumping on the correct pot. Along the way you'll naturally scoop up butterflies, which you can feed to this food vlogger. And true to form, as with every food vlogger, she doesn't know how to eat properly. <laughs> Then you'll run into Fisher, who says he's lost his fishing hook and deems you a suitable replacement. And while I initially groaned because oh my god we do not need fishing in every fucking game, it's actually just a glorified platforming challenge where you have to watch for fish leaping out of the ocean then go fling yourself at them. The second you hit the water you get reeled back, so you have to dive in exactly where the fish appears, which I think is a great way to do quote unquote fishing in a game like this. It's quirky in its execution but recontextualizes the core platforming instead of forcing you to deal with a whole new control setup for a minigame game, like so many platformers around the early to mid 2000s tended to do. And this is true of almost every objective you do, which I'm a big fan of. Completing these tasks nets you a Meow Meow coin and you'll need a certain amount of these to progress to the next island, where these and several other activities are repeated amongst a few tasks that are unique to each level. In the first level, for example, you'll climb to the top of a skyscraper and meet someone who needs a friend. In another, you'll solve the mystery of the murdered pool floaty. These tasks are pretty simple and honestly most of the time not all that involved, but it's usually the fun dialogue that bolsters them. Frankly, half the joy of this game is simply talking to the different characters and seeing what they have to say. A lot of it is pretty funny, though again the writing isn't going to gel with everyone, but to me at least, if the characters aren't being funny, they're being charming and relatable and making funny little sounds and I love it. I had a big old grin on my face the majority of the time I was playing this, because here comes Nico prioritizes funnies, pop culture references and comfy vibes over challenging gameplay, so it's really easy to just lose yourself exploring these islands and taking it all in. If you're not talking to one of the dozens of cute characters, you're taking in the tiny details littered about the place, or literally littering, haha <laughs> physics scratch my brain real good, or bumping into frogs and making them do the funny noise. This is it, this is heaven. I think that's one of the benefits of having such small levels. I remember the layouts of these like the back of my paw, and all the cute interactions I had with the world and its characters. But wow, these levels are small. The first level, I'll admit, didn't leave a great impression at first because it takes maybe half a minute to belly flop from one end to another and it was the same case with the second level. Both these islands honestly felt about the same size or maybe even smaller than some of the levels found in, say, Super Mario 64. The third level rolled around and even though it felt like it was about the same size as the previous two, it felt more dense and enjoyable to explore as it was a mountain. And my hopes were raised that we'd get some similarly large feeling levels from here on out so only to ride the train to the fourth level, and it was a swimming pool. <coughs> the last two levels that follow are much more dense and packed with things to do, but that's just it. There's only six levels here, not counting the brief tutorial level you get. And with how tiny they are, it's hard not to feel a little deflated once you reach the credits. I think there's just enough to do in each of these levels, what with collecting 10 cassette tapes and several bottled messages per level. And as you progress, you unlock more tasks to complete in previous levels, adding up to a total of 76 coins together. So there's actually a decent bit to do if you choose to stick around and sink your teeth into the game. But even so, with how small these environments are and with how few of them you can travel to, I just ended up feeling like I wanted more. To its credit though, that means these islands have very easy to remember layouts that make exploring them repeatedly to find everything a very relaxing experience. And thanks to the game unlocking more challenges in earlier levels as you progress and characters you've met also appearing in earlier levels, there's always something new to discover on return visits. So while these areas are small, they have a level of memorability that you don't often see in other platformers with much larger open areas like ukulele. And exploring them is a breeze due to the lack of challenge, which some people will misinterpret as a bad thing, but I don't think so. There's no hit points to be lost and no enemies to get in the way of exploration, so you're free to go about entirely at your own pace. Whether that's just running around and taking everything in as you go, or beelining straight towards the giant bouncy ball thing, because who the heck doesn't want to immediately jump into the giant bouncy ball? Uh oh, here comes Nico! 
Oh no, there goes Nico. But yeah, while there's plenty to do on each island, it ends up feeling like there's a bit less to do than there actually is because of how often these types of objectives are repeated, even if most of them are pretty fun. And that's basically my takeaway from Here Comes Nico. No matter which element of the game I point to and say I really enjoyed, there would be a big asterisk next to it that says, mm, but I wish there was more of it. Six levels is a fair number. A Hat in Time and Ukulele both have four or five worlds each, but I felt satisfied with the former because of how much there was to do in each world as well as the sheer variety on offer. Not with the latter though, Ukulele has some of the dumbest and most unnecessarily open level design in a platformer to date, but I digress. Six worlds would have been great here if only they were larger or more dense. Like it really does feel a bit like, Oh, is that it? When you show up to the fourth island and it's just a couple of swimming pools. And this extends to some of the objectives as well. Again, back at the swimming pool, you're tasked with helping a detective with finding out who murdered this kid's pool floaty. You go and investigate the crime scene, which is just you waddling up to it and pressing B to examine it, then returning to the detective, at which point the crime is immediately solved. It was the kid. They popped it because they can swim on their own because they're a big kid now. And you get a coin. All right. On the second island, you have to help bring back the wind to get a wind turbine spinning again. This is achieved by walking under these gate things of which I forget the name, which has you enter the spirit realm to summon a dragon who says, hey, here's the wind back. Now I have to go do my taxes. Bye. Boom, coin. This part could have been made way cooler if the spirit realm were a platforming challenge of some sort, but instead this just ends up feeling like a fetch quest more than anything. And nowhere is this more frustrating than on the very first island, where you meet Gunther. Gunther is very shy and likes to hang out on this rooftop with all his plants, because the plants aren't mean to him. Your job is to help him open up so that he can come down from the rooftop for a little while, which is achieved simply by talking to him. Gunther is a very sweet, relatable little critter who gets tired when exposed to prolonged social interaction, and when you talk to him once he's come down from the roof, he says something like, if I get tired I'll go back to my garden, but for now I'm having fun. And I just can't help but to think that this could have been taken further or been way more involved. What if instead of simply talking to him, you hung out with him while he visits some of the other inhabitants on the island? There's already a gameplay mechanic where you can pick up other people and carry them to different destinations, so that could have easily been implemented here and you would get to see Gunther gradually open up, but instead, what could have been a genuinely very sweet gameplay segment is delegated to a few text boxes and nothing more. It's clear that the game wants to touch on themes of mental health and Gunther would have been perfect for exploring things like social anxiety. And as someone who relates with Gunther pretty damn hard, it's sad not to see that taken further. Heck, it even happens with Nico. And I'll throw up a spoiler warning here, so just click ahead to this time or skip to the next chapter if you don't want to be spoiled, even if it's not like a huge thing or anything. Between each level, there's a short cutscene where you listen in on a message that Nico's mum or dad has sent them. And it's very clear that their living situation was not great. Nico's mum and dad are trying to find them while their sister calls on occasion and shows support, being someone with a shoulder to lean on. At one point, Nico's mum says, Guess what? I talked to a really good doctor and he says you're totally normal. He said he knows just how to fit you. I regressed into my primal form of a squeezed lemon when I read that. Big yikes. But then you just jump back into gameplay and suddenly everything's happy and colourful and comfy again. Oh yeah, maximum comfy vibes, baby. Gotta sip my bubble tea and take selfies and eat hot chip and- Okay, quick tangent. What the hell is bubble tea? Y'all really want to sit there and just drink this weird tea crap that has chunks of thing in it? Why would you drink something with solids at the bottom of it? Mm, gross, man, you're deranged. Anyway, the thing here is that Nico's struggles are pushed to the side for the vast majority of the game, and they don't get as much time to develop as I think they need to. On one hand, I think I get it. Nico's struggles are ambiguous and not super prominent to show that even the kindest, brightest, friendliest people have their own problems to deal with. That ambiguity could also be used to allow people to relate to Nico in whichever way they so choose. My first conclusion was that it was something to do with their gender, but it also could be some sort of depression or anxiety or other mental issue. Because even if you're sliding along on your tummy with a grin this big, you're not always a 100% happy person, you know? But that ambiguity is a little frustrating. I think I would have love to know exactly what Nico's problems are so that I could try to understand their struggle and relate to them more, but as it is, you just get some very vague, the doctor can fix you, please come home sweetie, we're trying to find you, why can't you just be normal? And even right at the end, your dad does end up finding you, and for a moment I thought, oh crap, this is gonna get nasty, but instead he just says, hey, glad you're doing okay, I'll, uh, I'll try to sort out the situation at home. And that's it, the tension there fizzles out entirely, but even so, without the context of what actually happened, it's a little hard to get worked up about this moment. Why is it such a bad thing that Nico's dad suddenly tracked them down? 
What did he do? I really wish this was fleshed out more because this could have been the highlight of the game for me and instead it just kind of fizzles out without any big payoff. There are bottles you can find with messages from Nico in them that go a little more in depth but not by much. At least as far as I can tell because I didn't find them all on account of how ridiculously well hidden they are but even then that's stuff locked away behind some optional collectibles and doesn't contribute to much anyway. I, I just wish there was a bit more. And speaking of wanting more, I think this game could have done with a little bit more polish. Most of the time, this game runs flawlessly, but there are a bunch of weird little niggles that do add up over time. Stuff like keyboard prompts showing up when using a controller, or getting randomly stuck on grass, or the swimming animation looking like you're floating in midair, or not being able to climb up certain ladders for no particular reason, or the big bouncy ball being buoyant at Hairball City but not at Salmon Creek. There was no option to reset progress or have multiple saves, which was a pain in the ass for me when I recorded the first three worlds but the footage came out in 30fps so I had to reset my progress by deleting a file in the game's Steam directory which, hi, hello Gabe, do you think maybe we could implement a way to delete cloud saves from the client? itself, considering all the major consoles already do it with absolutely no hassle. Yeah? Appreciate it, sweetie. Though I did tweet at the devs regarding this issue, and to their credit, they've been listening to feedback from everyone, and they introduced a feature to reset progress in an update the very next day. So big props to them. That was me who did that. Bow down to me or perish. And while I don't want to sit here being a negative Nancy, I had a bit of an issue with depth perception at times. Because of the 2D sprites running around in 3D environments, I did misjudge a few jumps here and there. But because the game is designed to be as relaxing and forgiving as possible, these moments were rarely a hindrance in the grand scheme of things. So whose idea was this then? I spent a good half an hour on this one volley challenge alone and I would never wish this on my worst enemy. With the other volley challenges, I had a much easier time because the ball would always have a shadow underneath it. But with this one, the lack of a shadow really highlighted how weird the depth perception is. I can't tell you how many times I thought I was about to hit the ball only for it to land a meter or so in front of me. And with how fast Trixie hits it back, it's almost impossible to make it from one end of the pool to the other in time, let alone also calculating exactly where you're supposed to be to hit the ball back and just, ah. The game certainly gets more challenging towards the end with a few different challenges like getting from one point of the map to another without touching the ground or carrying one of the turtles to another location without jumping or diving more than a certain amount of times and the flower pot puzzles eventually require quite a bit of thought. But these are still laid back challenges that don't require inhuman reflexes. This, this is just awful. Trixie, how could you? We were supposed to be friends. And this game's ultimate failure. There's a frog wizard who turns Nico into a frog, only to immediately change them back because they don't like it. Now, this is a very important lesson about boundaries and not randomly subjecting innocent bystanders to a baleful polymorph, but who the heck doesn't want to be a frog? Nico Frog DLC, when? Obviously, I kid about that last one. Kinda. But that really sums up my experience with Here Comes Nico. Everything here is good, I just wish it was all taken a bit further. I wish Nico's family issues were expanded upon. I wish the levels were larger so that there was more room for more creative objectives and platforming. I wish we got to play as Nico the Frog. There's so much more the game could be doing, but instead it feels comfortable in repeating the same few sets of challenges for every level. If you didn't enjoy volleyball, fishing, catching bugs and planting flowers in the first level, there's a good chance the game isn't going to hook you at all. And if you're looking for a platforming challenge, or any significant amount of platforming at all really, I would direct you elsewhere. Especially considering the game is 36 bucks here in Upside Downland, which is a little on the pricier side of things. I think maybe dropping a few bucks off the price of entry would help soften the blow a bit, not only for those who don't initially vibe with the more casual and laid back nature of the game, but also for how much content there is. I know this might sound a little hypocritical coming off my last review where I said I paid 140 bucks for Ratchet and Clank Rift Apart, but I still feel justified in having done so there. Whereas Here Comes Nico doesn't have the greatest variety in its gameplay and the locations where said gameplay takes place. But that doesn't mean Here comes Nico is without merit. Far from it. Because while I don't think this is going to satisfy those who are looking for any more than the most simple of platforming challenges, it still wholeheartedly succeeds at being the comfy little adventure it sets out to be. The small worlds and repetition of objectives can make it feel a bit tedious, but that does also help each island feel memorable, distinct, and most importantly, cozy, as do the adorable denizens of each island. And though the lack of challenge left the game feeling a bit empty at first, I really grew to appreciate it as I made progress through it. Between its adorable aesthetic, its chill music, and its toned back challenge, I think it's exactly what it tries to be. A game for tired people. I wanted more.
And I hope we do get more, be that through official DLC or maybe some sort of Steam Workshop support. But the fact that it leaves me wanting more in the first place is something I can only see as a good thing. I hope we get to see more of this world, these characters, this absolute being. Despite my reservations, I can absolutely recommend Here Comes Nico to those who are fully aware that this isn't the next A Hat in Time. Because it isn't. It never was. It's a comfy little game for people who want to feel comfy. It's the antithesis to modern gaming. We don't always need brutally difficult action RPGs designed to make streamers do the funny scream when they die for the 432nd time. Heck, we don't always need violence or even any enemies or an antagonist to deal with. If you hear that and it triggers a response in your head that says, well, what's the point if there's no challenge? Then this game may not be for you. But there will be some of you who will hear all this and think, you know what, that's exactly what I need right now. And to you I say, you're probably gonna love this. You'll start the game being all sad and only listening to Elliot Smith and Sunny Day Real Estate and end up leaving all content and cheerful and wanting to play Bill Withers and Sia Rose on repeat. Descend into the comfy dimension with me, where everything is made of fuzzy blankets and stuffed animals and strawberry milk and there are frogs who say nice things about you. Heck, I'm in such a cozy little mood after playing this that I just realised I haven't dropped a single F-bomb in this video. Well, better drop one before people think I've gone soft. <gasps> Friend. Alright, so I'm going to try something a bit different for the outro for this video. Um, I asked my patrons to ask me a bunch of questions and I'm going to answer them. And if this takes off, then this will be a regular thing that patrons can do. They won't be super long answers or anything. Uh, the, these will be totally scripted so that I'm not just like, you know, aimlessly spewing words like I do in my actual Q&As. But um, yeah, let's see what we got here. Sofox asks, Dear Remy, how do you type with... Shit, I did that one already. Um, who put the bump in the bumper bumper bump? Wait, that's Basil Brush's catchphrase, right? <laughs> bump, 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 bump. Native Light asks, I'm a patron now, so may your obligation senses be overstimulated. What are your top 10 weed eaters? Look, I'd do a top 10, but I'd rather just sing my praises for the Husqvarna Straight Shaft Gas String Trimmer, available now at Lowe's for the low, low price of $2.39. Luigi Freak 3456 asks, what do you think of the Flat Out series? Only ever played Flat Out 2 at a friend's place, uh, seemed really cool, otherwise haven't touched the series, but wouldn't mind checking it out someday, even if Flat Out 3 is, or at least was, the lowest rated game on Steam at some point. Also, Flat Out 2's soundtrack is too good. Absolutely goated Fallout Boy choice. Inferno the Fox asks, what garbage opinions did you drag out of the trash this time, you stinky rack. Burnout Paradise sucks, the Switch Pro Controller feels like shit, fairies with generic Fox Sonas are totally valid, and I'm a bee by the Black Eyed Peas is low-key a bit of a bop. The Dervinator asks, Harmonix gives you the opportunity to create your own song pack for Rock Band, so you can pick any five tracks regardless of copyright licensing. What do you pick? I would try to pick songs I love, but also ones that I think would have fun instrumentation to work off of. So, World Symphony by Acid Man, and The Battle Begun by RX Bandits, It's So Ficus by Toe Hider, Neoprene Byzantine by Closure in Moscow, and Gurzel by Psychedelic Porn Crumpets. They probably wouldn't sell that well, but Harmonix gave me the choice, and so I say, screw you, appease me. So yeah, this might become a semi-regular thing, depending on how often people ask me questions or not, or I could ditch it, I don't know, we'll see how we go. And also, as for the reading of uh, patrons' names, out and stuff there's been some people who are like oh yeah this is cool and there are other people who are like uh, uh what's really the point so if people don't really care about that that i can stop doing that as well and then just do like you know post the names in the end slate and then just you know do the q a stuff and show fan art and stuff but anyway um i will still thank them this time um where's my big list here we go here's a big list of patrons thank you to so fox k damian maxted dalek boy sergio palsis aether Gruby, alice whitaker bartlett Furball, or is it Furbell? Heat Hoot Skyet, Jayet, Johannes Anderson, Jazzy Become Android, Kuroto the Kitsune, Leo Alex 50, Native Light, Nathaniel Forrest, Pear Basket, Philip Elk, Sheepy, Squid Superstar, The Dervinator, Travis Miranda, and Zip. Um, as per usual, thank you to all my patrons, no matter what tier you're pledging to. Goes without saying, you guys help keep this channel alive, but, uh, yeah, um, follow me on Twitter, check out the Patreon, uh, join the Rack Shack Discord server. If you want to send fan art, you can send it to me at Twitter, at RemyRaccoonYT, or you can send it to TheRemyRaccoon at gmail.com. And I'll see you guys next time on, uh, either an introduction of a new series or a review of Daxter. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, and if you don't do any of those, I will come find you and steal your teeth. Uh, bye bye now.